Greetings, Fusion fans. This is Dr. Matt Moynihan. Wanted to give a short update in, uh, this is late August 2021. Very exciting news uh, from the National Ignition Facility. Uh, 1.3 megajoule shot resulting uh, from a 250 kilojoule on target energy. So it looks like it could be ignition, although I'm not going to state up front that it is ignition. In fact, at this point, if you're claiming that, I think it would be speculation. We need to see access to the data and we need to see a formal paper publication from Livermore. And I'm sure we will see that before the November Dense Plasma Physics Conference uh, in Pittsburgh this year. Uh, I want to tell a story about this because this is obviously a very historic thing. Um, the Thursday after the shot, I was on the phone with a scientist uh, in the ICF community. I won't say who. We were talking about something completely different. And then, apropos of nothing, he just blurted out over the phone that NIF got ignition, uh, which I uh, was in a little disbelief about. So once I got off the phone, I actually sent out an email to my network to see if anybody else had similar news. And within about an hour, I had two or three other emails coming back from folks in my network that said, nope, we got similar news. And then the next morning, we had a large email from Livermore staff basically indicating that it looked very promising. So that news kind of spread around the internet very quickly. And it was a good thing that Livermore put out a statement um, the following week because uh, it was sort of becoming a rumor mill amongst the, the network of plasma physicists and fusion folks that this had happened. So Livermore needed to get out ahead of that. And that was a good thing from the press office. But the, st the statement itself is not, not enough, not sufficient. We need a formal uh, plasma physics journal article, and hopefully we will get that uh, in, in the next uh, couple months um, that lay out the exact data and the diagnostic measurements. Um, so what are we talking about here? We're talking about uh, ignition. In 1972, John Nichols, who is considered one of the founders of ICF, laid out a plasma physics paper, a four-pager, where he spelled out the ICF concept. Now, of course, ICF had existed maybe eight, ten years before that, but it was classified. And it's really built around the physics of a nuclear explosion, if you want to trace it even further back. So ignition is a fusion chain reaction. Now, most people know of nuclear chain reactions. They think of the fission process, which is where uranium splits, big atoms split into little atoms. They create neutrons that kick off more uh, splitting, and then they create more neutrons, and the, and the reactions chain together. Well, in fusion, this is, the, this is the similar process, but with fusion. Two little atoms fuse. They generate uh, byproducts that then go into other atoms. That, or then they drop off. Excuse me. They drop their heat into the plasma that they're in, and that heats the material hot enough to kick off more fusion reactions. So that's the concept of ignition, is that fusion reactions are chained together. Now, up until August 8th, 2021, we hadn't seen any indication that we had that in a laboratory. Um, because fusion reactions generate a, a lot of energetic particles that generally just fly away. So, you know, a typical product would be like a 3 million, KEV, 3 million EV um, helium atom that's so hot that it's just going to fly away from the plasma and you can't hold it in long enough for it to deposit its energy and then heat the plasma and cause further fusion reactions. So that's that's 99.999% of the ICF shots in the world. That's what's happened. Now, this experiment on August 8th indicates that something different has happened, that the material is hot enough and it's dense enough and it's confined long enough that some of the atoms drop their heat into the plasma, heating it up to get further fusion reactions. So now we have fusion events chained together and that's what ignition is. And that's why the energy output suddenly jumps uh, so significantly. Now, this shot, this 1.3 megajoule, it indicates an eight-fold increase in the previous record. So an eight-fold increase in previous output. And that's the exciting news that we're talking about here. 
So how would you prove that you had ignition occurring? Well, you'd look for neutrons that were present longer than normal. Because every time you do a fusion reaction, you make energetic neutrons, at least, excuse me, at least with the fuels that they use at NIF. Not all, not all fuels do neutrons. But the fuels they use at NIF, deuterium, deuterium, or deuterium, tritium, make neutrons. So in this case, what you'd be looking for is neutrons that hang out longer than normal. Um, and the physics of a uh, NIF implosion, you know, it's 200 billionths of a second for everything, start to finish. And then the specific physics are measured in like the hundreds of picoseconds. So you might have a hundred, you know, several hundred picoseconds for the laser beam to convert to x-rays. And then you have another period of hundreds of picoseconds where the x-rays impact the central target and create the shock wave that squeezes the material together. So this is, this is inertial confinement, which is compression by shock wave. So you have basically a laser beam hitting a surface of an ice explosion outward, equal and opposite compression wave inward, Newton's third law, and you have a compression wave that compresses the material. So your diagnostics would pick up an initial wave of neutrons, but then what you should see is follow-on neutrons that are coming from secondary fusion reactions. So that's, that's the kind of data that I would be looking for uh, in a paper from Livermore that would demonstrate ignition. I would look for other things. Uh, you know, the, there's x-rays that come off a, a hot fusing plasma. So if you saw a secondary x-rays, that would be another indication that um, fusion had occurred. So Livermore has diagnostics for all this stuff. Uh, it's all pinhole cameras <laughs> because the shock wave off of a, a imploding ICF target is so crazy uh, that you want to have pinhole cameras to, to draw in the material uh, so you block most of the detector. Um, but there's also other indications they have um, essentially, uh, you can consider them sort of uh, cardstock or plates where neutrons penetrate the plates and, and there's a whole series of them. And, and as they go through, um, you get a sort of time-lapse look at what happens as the, the threat coming off the ICF implosion penetrates different layers of the cardstock or, or detector layers. So th there's a lot of different diagnostics. Those are the data that I would want to see. Either way, this is a very exciting uh, result. Um, I think for the fusion community, it kind of changes the landscape a little bit. I would say that it's a win for large government programs. It'll, clearly, Eater is going to win uh, coming out of this because it shows that when the government puts uh, tons and tons of money behind something, they actually do deliver. The scientists can deliver on the promises that were made um, to, uh, to get the funding in the first place. So, you know, for me personally, I, I mean, I was coming through the ICF program in 2006 to 2012. About that time, NIF was sort of, it was the run-up to NIF, and NIF was the big, exciting story in the ICF community. And we were all very disappointed when we didn't meet the congressionally mandated deadline for ignition. And here we are, you know, nine years later, and we've got ignition now, or what looks to be like ignition. Should hold my tongue until we see the data. Um, that's exciting. It's a win for government programs. I think it's going to change the private landscape some because investors are going to take a, a real closer look at some of the ideas that are coming out of the commercial space. Because if, if it looks like it's going to take 200 kilojoules of laser energy to get fusion chain reactions, that sets a pretty high bar for the commercial companies to meet. So I think some of the companies are gonna gonna be squashed because of that, because the technical barriers to ignition are now gonna look a lot higher and harder to reach, and so investors are gonna be, I think, like practically more skeptical of the pitches that they get. Um, but at the same time, some of the companies that are incumbents that are already in the space, they are gonna benefit. Because a fusion generally is going to get a lot more interest. This is worldwide news. It's going to drive a lot of interest into the private space. So I think on the private side, there's going to be a thinning and growing of the pack. There'll be some companies that'll die off. The ones that are left are going to get bigger and fatter with more funding and more staffing and more support. 
So that's what I, my take on this. I think the large government programs are going to benefit. I also think Livermore is going to make a very big deal about this. They are going to make a lot of noise. They are probably going to have their point people and pitch men and scientists out in as many forums and as many publications and as many podcasts and news stories and op-eds as they can possibly get uh, because they want, they want the press, they need the press, they want to build the case for ICF. Now, in terms of an ICF power plant, there are a number of other barriers that have to be crossed before ICF becomes a viable approach for power plants. Um, even though we've got ignition, that's great. But to make a power plant out of ICF, the, for, one of the problems you have to get is you have to manufacture that, that target, that ball of deuterium tritium, um, repeatedly. And you have to do it the same way and the same tolerances of quality. And you have to do it at a reasonable price. And you have to be able to place that target in the center of your chamber uh, repeatedly and the same time in the same way every single time. And then you have to shoot and get ignition. Now, the shot frequency is, a, is another thing. To get power out of this, I mean, this is a pulsed approach. So to become a continuously operating power plant, you would need to shoot very frequently. You'd shoot, you'd harvest the power, and then you'd save that and then run that out in a continuous fashion. So that's another barrier to ICF that we have to deal with. Now, in terms of getting to a power plant, I think the teams that might know the best are, in fact, not Livermore, but commercial entities like First Light Fusion, Marvel Fusion, and, and some other startups uh, that have been at the ICF uh, commercialization game for about 10 years now. First Light was founded in 2011 in, uh, in, out of Oxford. Uh, they have over $100 million invested. Uh, they've been at it a while, and they've managed to do a lot of innovative things in the ICF space. But do they have what it's take to get some commercial power? I don't know. Um, they, don't, they don't publish a lot of uh, gory details about their activities. So it's going to be interesting to see how this goes. Anyway, that's my status update for nuclear fusion. Very exciting news from the National Ignition Facility. The fusion community should be really enthusiastic about this. I mean, if you take a step back, this is a win for everyone. Regardless of if you're a tokamak person or a mirror person or you're a superconductor expert or an ICF person or you work at General Fusion or TAE or even Phoenix or Shine, um, this, is a, this is a win for the entire fusion community because it's going to drive a lot more interest. And I think APS this year is going to be kind of a zoo. So <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Anyway, hope everyone's doing well.